Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Bay doors are open. I am your host, Doug Heller, a film critic and historian for TalkMovieToMe.com, uh, along with my fab co-host, Jerry Dean Roberts of ArmchairCinema.com and ArmchairOscars.com. Hi, Jerry. Hello. Uh, today, um, in honor of what would have been my mother's 67th birthday on September 16th, um, we are talking about the Beatles films, most uh, mostly centered on A Hard Day's Night, uh, but we'll be we'll be doing uh, we'll be delving into Help and Yellow Submarine, um, and because Jerry hasn't seen them, we'll hold off on Magical Mystery Tour and let it be, and uh, <laughs> for for now. Um, uh, but I'll talk about them a little bit at the end. Uh, so I'll talk about my uh, uh, history with with this picture after after you, Jerry. Why don't Why don't you give your brief synopsis of your of your time with this picture? Well, on our last episode, we made the point that, or you made the point that I had never seen this film, mm-hmm. which I had, um, which is partially true. <laughs> this is a movie that's on a li- a lot of lists. You know, mm-hmm. innovative, the most innovative film, the greatest film, the greatest musical. Uh, Roger Ebert called it the the greatest musical, probably right under Singing in the Rain. Right. Um, and it, I had tried for years to watch this film, but cosmically somehow I just never could because. I, I don't understand this, but somehow I would get up to the point in the film where I would start watching it, get up to the point in the film, probably about the point where they start singing, um, I should have known better. Mm-hmm. Something would happen. <laughs> Someone would want me to do something. Someone would call, come to the door. The tape would break, which mm-hmm. actually happened at one point. <laughs> uh, some kind of just something would swoop in and keep me from watching the rest of this film. So last night, I waited, or the other night, rather, I waited until my wife went to bed and just said, okay, I'm turning off all distractions, I'm turning off my phone, I'm turning off everything, and I'm going to actually sit down and really watch this movie. I enjoyed it so much that I've now, I saw the movie, today is Saturday, I saw the movie on for, for the first time on Monday. Mm-hmm. I've now seen it four times. <laughs> there is so much to this movie. It's a simple little comedy. It's a nice, sweet, simple little comedy, but there's so much to it. There's so much, so much to it. It's, it's really, uh, it's remarkable how simple it is and yet how innovative it is. I've been watching this movie oh, since I was very, very little. Um, my, my mother, uh, who passed away in December of 2014, uh, was a massive Beatles fan. Um, I was born on February 6th. They landed on February 7th, 1964. I was born on February 6th, 1981. She lamented her entire rest of her life that I wasn't born on the 7th to be on the same day that the Beatles landed in America. You couldn't have waited 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she always kind of held out hope that, uh, that, that my sister would marry Paul's son, um, because yeah. they were about the same age. Uh, and then she held out hope that my son would marry Paul's youngest daughter from Heather Mills because they were born around the same time, too. Uh, so, uh, I, so I've been watching this forever. Uh, VHS, DVD, and uh, now Blu-ray. Um I my son was hook is hooked on the Beatles too. He actually goes to bed every night to this soundtrack. Um and he's he's 13 now as of this recording. 
sorry for in the future. He won't always be 13. Um, but uh, I had tried to get him to watch it. He was he was deep in love with Yellow Submarine, which we'll get to. Because how, could you, how could you not be? Um, but I tried to get him to watch this when he was smaller, and he, he, didn't, he didn't really take to it. And then in summer of 2014, um, in what ended up being my mother's last trip out here to Pittsburgh to visit us, um, it was playing at, a, at an art house theater in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, it was the, uh, the Criterion Collection's 4K uh, remaster and uh, restoration. Mm-hmm. And so I got her and took my son and we went down and we watched it in the theater about five rows back in the middle. Yeah. And she had seen it obviously since that time, but this was of course the first time she'd seen it in the theater in at that point, 50 years. And, uh, wow. Yeah, it was, uh, it was really amazing. It was, uh, it was, it was really the last time that I really got to spend with her before she got really sick with her cancer and, and died. So it's, it's very special to me. Um, and we watch it all the time. Uh, my son loves it. So he, he tries to put it on all the time and it, it's actually gotten to the point now over the last few years that I'm just like, you know what? We watch this too much. <laughs> I don't say I that very regarded, often. But... <laughs> I have always regarded, um, films as pieces of time mm-hmm. because one thing I always, uh, one, one phrase that I always use, and, uh, uh, because uh, Dick Clark said something years ago that had a profound impact on me. He said, music is the soundtrack of your life. I always loved that quote. When you listen to music, you are listening to a piece of time Mm -hmm. that you remember from your life. People you met, places you were, the frame of mind you were in, Movies are the same way. Mm-hmm. Movies have a way of being a window of time. And if you go back and you look at a film like, let's just say The Wizard of Oz, mm-hmm. you are looking at a moment captured in time of little Judy Garland, mm-hmm. 17 years old, uh, a sweet girl, immensely talented before the pills so before the problems long before her drug problems long before long before the weight of the world just you know yeah. broken marriages drugs um Mickey career Rudy. setbacks yeah yeah and you're just looking at this young girl captured in that perfect moment of time mm-hmm. when it was really just starting right a hard day's night is like is the same way mm-hmm this movie captures the Beatles. This was 1964. Mm-hmm. They were just at the beginning of their popularity. And they were all in their 20s. Paul was 22. Ringo was 23. And George and John were both 24. Mm-hmm. And you are capturing them in, in A Hard Day's Night at the moment before they had become pop culture icons. Before drugs, before the um, the style changes, before the experimentation, before the Maharishi and all of that stuff, mm-hmm. before the weight of their fame really started to press down on them. Right. So the smiles are genuine. They're having so a blast. The, yeah. And they're having a wonderful time. <laughs> they're kids. They're having a great time. That's what I took from this film. Is that we are the, the movie has put a time stamp mm-hmm. on their lives, on their music, and on their career and on their personality. Before what, and, but all of the negative stuff was still to come. Mm-hmm. So you have this perfect portrait of these guys. So 
A Hard Day's Night does what a movie is supposed to do in that it just it, it grabs hold of him at that moment. Mm-hmm. And what really what really I loved about it is how free the movie is. Yeah. How loose the film is. It's mm-hmm. cinema verite. In a lot of ways, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. In a lot of ways, it's cinema verite in that um, it's not... It doesn't feel propped up. No. There are no scenes in the movie that feel like bits. They felt like, you know, the the guys were off camera. They said, okay, let's do this. And then they went on camera, and then they just did their thing. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing is, and I love, it's a comedy. It is. It's a musical, but it is also a comedy. Mm-hmm. They have not one serious moment in the entire film. Pretty much not, yeah. Except when they're performing. Well, I think Ringo's uh, little side trip is... Uh... Is kind of down. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. When when he's walking around well, and they've got the instrumental of this boy, um, over. According him. to legend, the reason he was so the reason he seemed so down was because he was hungover. <laughs> <laughs> it's been said. <laughs> but yeah, it is an introspective moment. But you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's yeah. Basically, them goofing around. Mm-hmm. And. Um, What I got from the the story, or basically the the whole movie takes place in almost in almost entirely indoors, mm-hmm. where they're running around, they're um, they're inside a train, then they're in a studio, and every time they step outside, they get chased by somebody. Mm-hmm. What I got from it was the beginnings of the bird in a gilded cage, mm-hmm. the idea that they at all times had to be protected because they were all of these rabid fans just running after them mm-hmm. every time they stepped outside. And uh, so I got that, and it's, it's, it's typified, it's, it's symbolized in that scene in the train, the first musical number that they have together when they're singing I Should Have Known Better. When they're playing cards. They're, yeah, when they're yeah. playing cards and they're sitting in that holding cell. Mm-hmm. And... Um, they're singing and they're in this cramped space and you see the bars, you see the gate that to me sort of symbolizes what fame did to them. Yeah. It boxed them in. Mm hmm. Which is something that they said, uh, later on was a, was a catalyst for their breaking up was that they got, they got boxed in with the Beatles and they didn't feel like they could grow as as artists because there was the expectation of the Beatles. So yeah, and that and at the end I think also also their um yeah, they they were wanting to do solo acts. And also the death of Brian Epstein. Right. His, when when their when their manager Brian Epstein killed himself um and then they started to do their own business uh management and they'd hired a a, a new business manager that uh that john liked george hated and the other two just kind of didn't really trust um Mm -hmm. and that kind of they they started fighting a lot after that and splitting splitting them apart and And uh, yeah well (laughs) it was less yoko and more the the suicide of brian epstein uh yeah Yoko did reportedly say that she thought John could do more than just write, I want to hold your hand, but he was doing that at the end, um, with a lot of stuff. Uh, but I don't, I don't want to demonize her too much because she's over, over the years, she's done a lot to preserve, uh, John's legacy and, uh, um, be really respectful of it and she uh granted them access to uh his unreleased demos back when they were doing the anthology in 96 and they they wrote those two new songs based around demos of his and she was very instrumental in that and she and paul have gotten made up (laughs) um but uh this this movie it's everything that you're saying saying it is and it's all hung 
their fame is the is the backdrop, but the catalyst is uh, Wilfred Bramble. Oh my God, I love Wilfred Bramble play, playing uh, Paul's grandfather. Um, mm-hmm. And they they're always like, "Isn't he clean? He's very clean," mm-hmm. as opposed to being a dirty old man. He's it's he's an very joke. he's very clean, um, but of course he is not. And as Paul calls him, he is a king mixer. Uh, he hates group that unity. That joke, by the way, that joke, by the way, was an in joke mm-hmm. because Wilfred Bramble, if you don't know who he is, he was an Irish, he was an Irish-born actor. Who, the old man, by the way, was fifty-two at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, was played by a fifty-two-year-old actor. <laughs> Wilfred Bramble was on a long-running series. Um, British television series called Stepto and Son, hmm. which later Norman Lear remade in America as Sanford and Son. Mm-hmm. Wilfred Bramble played the part that ba- basically originated the part that uh, the Red Fox would play in the American version, the Fred Sanford part. The running joke in that show is that everyone was always calling him a dirty old man, <laughs> which is why the joke. <laughs> which is why he's very clean. <laughs> so it, 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 it was kind of an in-joke at the time. But yeah, the Wilfred Bramble, that face, that he's, fish face, is just, it's just great. <laughs> he's, so, he's so funny, and, and having a veteran actor like him next to this quartet that had never acted uh, mm-hmm. at all in, in pretty much anything... Um, was really he kind of set the bar for them and they really did play up to it um, although this movie has this movie has such a low opinion of the elderly <laughs> it does <laughs> they're treating at the beginning of this movie they are treating him like a dog mm. I mean <laughs> like a family pet <laughs> he has that great scene where um, and you have to really pay attention to the dialogue because it's so fast there's this. I, I had to watch it. I watched it the other night with uh, with the captions on. <laughs> Paul has a great line where he says, uh, "Keep an eye on him. He'll keep. Uh, he'll cost you a fortune and breach of promise suit." <laughs> and then later on, they lose track of him and they find him in a boxcar with a. Or they find him in a berth with a um, with a young woman. He says, "Congratulate me, boys. I'm engaged." <laughs> 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 That's when you see him then in the guard cage. <laughs> yep. It's great, and they keep him locked up, and and they they just keep shuttling him around, and he keeps getting out, and because uh, I was supposed to be here for a change of scenery, but so far I've been in a in a train, in a room, and a car, and a room, and a room, and a room. I love it. <laughs> I love it when uh, uh, there's a scene in a hotel room that I love. Is is or it's right after they get off this train is when they start getting fan mail, mm-hmm. and um, they bring in all this fan mail. They hand it to John and George and and uh, and Paul, and they hand one letter to Ringo, <laughs> and then the other guy comes in with this giant arm load, and it's it's Ringo. But they call him Richard Starkey. Uh huh. I was surprised by that. They call him Richard Starkey, which is Ringo's real name. Mm-hmm. That was unusual. Yeah, but, and um, uh, grandfather Wilfred Bramble refers to him later in that canteen scene as "poor little Richard." Mm-hmm. Poor little Richard. Uh huh. Yeah, and then there's that scene where he gets an invitation to go to a gambling den. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't want to go there, laddie. <laughs> All for cheap thrills and past women. And he takes the invitation and stuffs it in his coat pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Ends up going himself. That that little bit where he's like runs out of chips, he picks up the platter and a little note, and he puts a number on it, and he takes it over to a person, pretends he's a waiter, gets the chips, comes back, and plays the chips on the table. <laughs> and he gets a bingo, and it's, it's, it's bongo. <laughs> it's, it's bongo. <laughs> <laughs> he is so funny in this movie. He is. He's one of those actors that he's not just funny. He he looks funny. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. He's got an odd face. He's got this wide mouth and these big eyes, and he's just got this this cheek this cheeky little smile, and he's just great. I love Wilbur Bramble. <laughs> <laughs> but so they they hook him being a troublemaker, and that kind of helps move them forward mm-hmm. in each of their things um, until they get to uh, the studio and they have like what two or three hours before the uh final run through yeah and uh ringo goes off and they they kind of do their own separate things as well as um they eventually come together and uh so to speak so to speak um they they break out and they they get out of that uh of the studio they go down the fire escape they literally escape and they get to run around in this park in this uh squash court or four four square yeah four they, did, square they did this thing where they the uh this frustrated handler that they have norm tells them stay in your room until stay in this room until we're time for rehearsal and the the room is off to the right and they instead take a they take a, a detour off to the left, which is the fire door. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they then they they step out on the fire escape, and Ringo says, "We're out." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they go right into uh, "Can't Buy Me Love." Mm-hmm. And they they shoot this. Uh, the editing is is not cut on the beat, but it's cut to the speed of the song as well mm-hmm. as i mean they use this helicopter shot that they, that is 20 second 26 seconds long which is an eternity in film yeah um just hovering and you can see the camera shaking because it's it's not mounted properly on in in the in the in the helicopter and you're watching one of them run up this uh sidewalk and run down and they're just goofing around to, they're not doing anything they're, they're not just... doing anything they're just goofing around uh well well obviously they're not even he- hearing the song because i don't even know if it was written yet um and uh it's it's just this wonderful moment of them blowing off steam and yeah. and having fun it's the most and... famous scene in the movie is uh-huh. that uh, when they're jumping around on the squash court and they sort of seem to be coming out of the air mm-hmm and they're just kind of falling, and it's um, it's George, Paul, and John, and they just seem to be coming out of the air. And then he cut to Ringo, and he takes this little hop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of one of the days that they were shooting that, um, John actually had to go to a book signing for his uh, book of poetry called "In His Own Right," W R I T E. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's just the three of them. So. The director, Richard Lester, whom we'll talk about more in, in a little bit, did it like a point of view shot so he could look down at somebody's shoes that matched what John was wearing. And then yeah. Paul kind of grabbed the camera and they did it like a POV shot so that it could be seen as John taking the footage mm-hmm. when he wasn't even there. That's why when they're laying down, it's just the three of them mouthing mm-hmm. whatever they're mouthing. It's not the lyrics i thought they were singing along at first and then i thought maybe they were fake snoring no, it's kind they're, of they're like they're chatting i don't know what they're yeah. saying but uh because i'm not an experienced lip reader but uh they are not mimic they are not mouthing the words um yeah and uh this this especially this um and the uh the the first uh two musical sequences the opening credits when they're running away from the fans and um when they're in the in the train playing the cards these are all proto music videos yeah um and they wanted to do something that wasn't just a a a performance film or one of those back in the 60s there was a lot like the 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 hip films for the kids um would have some stupid plot and then 
for some reason, a well-known band would show up. Yeah. Play a song or two and then go away. Um, or you would have them have an elaborate cameo of some sort. Right. A movie like this, at had the time, you would have had it be about uh, the Beatles trying to get to a show and getting tied in with a bunch of um, burglars mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. Or some kind of stupid plot. Basically what the monkeys would have been. Right, right. So, or, um, or um, you know... Frankie Valli and Annette Funicello throwing a big bash and the Beatles right. get to play it on the beach. Um, this movie lets them play. Um, it lets them just go out and have a good time. Yeah, yeah, it does. It doesn't, a lot of it doesn't feel scripted. Now, some of it does because there's a, <clears throat> a wonderful scene that does feel a little bit, maybe a little bit uh, scripted. It's the scene where they get off the train and they're having this sort of weird pseudo uh, press junket. And it's quick cut to each of them being asked a question. Mm-hmm. And the, <laughs> they're asking them really kind of ordinary reporter questions, you know, um, curious questions like, um, what do you think about this? What do you call this hairstyle? And George says, Arthur. Awesome. <laughs> you know, and uh, the lady says, asks Ringo, you know, are you a mod or a rocker? And he says, I'm, I'm a, a mocker. mocker. <laughs> and then there's that scene where um, uh, the lady asks John, do you have any hobbies? And he writes something down on her notepad and hands it back to her. She's shocked. <laughs> and if you look carefully, what he actually wrote was tits. <laughs> and uh, you can only see the TS, but basically that's what he wrote. <laughs> well, <But laughs> the, it's it's funny that you say that that feels the most scripted because although this the film was um, the script was nominated for an Oscar, as um, was the score, as was the score, um, but uh, that sequence um, because of the throngs of people outside had to be improvised. They had to move everybody inside and they just did this kind of fake press junket and Mm. they had them making all that stuff up. Um, them keeping asking Paul these questions and he just answers, no, actually we're just good friends. And (laughs) do you see your father often? No, actually we're just good friends. And, (laughs) Like, has, has success changed you at all? Yeah. Yes. And then... <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, sort of thumbing their nose at this convention. You know, there's this thing that goes on throughout the film in which people are persistently trying to get them to behave. Mm-hmm. There's oh, yeah. a scene at the beginning on the train, and this, this really tells you about this generation. There's a scene at the beginning when they're on the train and they're they're in the train berth with this man, um, and the first thing he does is he gets up and he closes the window. Mm-hmm. Say, Excuse me, sir. You know, there's four of us. Can we have the window open? No, I ride the train twice a week. I have I some have, rights. I, yeah, I have my rights. You know, and he's just kind of being elitist. And uh, mm-hmm. um, Ringo turns on the radio. The man reaches over and turns it off. And then he says something really telling. He says, I fought the war for your lot. And you Ringo know, and says, like, I bet you're sorry you won. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a great twist on, did your mother have any children that lived? I bet she yeah. regrets it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> interesting thing it's like um this culture this youth culture that has come up after the war just doesn't care no they don't really they don't kowtow to the generation before this is probably the first generation in british in in maybe british culture that didn't feel that duty to uh to king and country Mm -hmm. that maybe their parents generation did right because they're their whole they're, they're, they're part of the counterculture mm-hmm. um, individuality free thinking you know free love 
and that that's kind of the texture of how they behave in their mm -hmm. film. And that train scene was actually inspired by a real life incident that happened to them. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. They told um, they told the 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 screenwriter um, was it Alan Owen A L U N Alan Owen yeah that uh, something like this happened and he wrote it in and uh, so they they kind of got to re replay that so that that was an actual real incident. There may be a reason why, you know, we talk, we're, we're, we're talking a lot about how free and loose this film is, feels, and how um, the dialogue just seems to, it doesn't, it, it rarely ever feels set up. Right. And how the whole fi film feels in a verite. One of the reasons I think they're probably allowed to do that is that this was not a film that was taken seriously. No, no, no. This was a product hammered together by United Artists. This movie was hammered together by United Artists in an effort to be a promotional thing for the album. Right, that, that didn't exist. Uh, I, th I think Which is why said, it's in black and white. Right. They um, they had the, the, the producer, and they said, hey, do you want to do a, a, a movie with the Beatles? And he said, well, why, why do you want to do a movie with them? And they said, well, because... If there's a movie, then there's a soundtrack album, and our and our label, our you know our musical counterpart that we own, uh, is their record company. So uh, if we put out a movie, we have new songs for a soundtrack, and that's a new record. So mm -hmm. that's all they really wanted. But um, they got Richard Lester, who was a Philadelphia director working in American London, born. American born from philadelphia working in london um and he incidentally directed this and their follow-up help in 1965 and uh also directed the three musketeers which became also the sequel to four musketeers because they shot so much that they had enough for either a three-hour movie or two 90-minute movies, and they decided to make their money, which angered the crew, which was supposed to be, or the cast, which was supposed to be the Beatles. Yeah. Um, he had originally wanted to get them back together, but that was 1973. They were still kind of, they were individually talking to each other, but they weren't talking to each other as a group. And right. uh, they, they, they they would they would never do it. So he got Michael York and um, Oliver Reed and Richard. It's interesting if you really look into what they had wanted to do that never came to light. Yeah. One of the things they wanted to do is the Beatles had an idea uh, in mind to do Lord of the Rings. Yes, they did. <laughs> Which and. <laughs> I genuinely don't know how that would have worked, but I can guarantee that I would have loved every minute of it. But right or wrong, good or bad, I kind of wanted to see that. <laughs> yeah. And I think Paul was playing Frodo, John was playing, um, I think George was playing Gandalf, John was playing um, Gollum, and I can't remember who Ringo was playing. Um, but they were, they, it, it was in talks. Mm -hmm. It just never came together. You know, that was in the late sixties, and it just, you know, it, it never worked. But part of me would love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the films that they did come up with, mm -hmm. beginning with this one, um, no one ever knew what this film was going to become. Mm. They didn't know that this film was going to become as innovative as it was. No. They didn't know it was going to be a success. They thought it was just going to be a toss-off film, just done with it. And, right. You know, because even when they were when they were done with it, the UA said to the producer, "So, what do you think we should do? Do you think the Beatles are gonna are gonna be around for a while, or should we just make a whole lot of prints, put them out in as many theaters as we can, and make our money on them while the while while they're popular, sort of a strike while the iron's hot." Or should we limit the prints and just kind of roll it out over time? Are they going to stick around? And the producer was like, I don't know. They're popular now. Do what you think is right. <laughs> yeah, because at the time, <laughs> nobody had any idea 
what the Beatles were going to become because they at the time it was easy to think that the Beatles might have just been a flash in the pan, mm-hmm. that they might have been here today, gone tomorrow. By the time the movie rolled out, you know, the Beatles could have been over the hill. Right, and because at the time, I mean, there was there was there was very few, there were very few. Uh, Stay, there was very little staying power in the world of rock and roll. Um, Elvis had faded uh, after being in the army and in movies that weren't very good. Yeah. Putting out. Elvis could act, but they kept putting him in these vanilla flavored movies that right. were not worth it. Not worth right, it right, time. right. And, um, you know, producing hits off of those soundtracks, but not anything to the level that he had um, in the in the mid fifties, and uh, he, so his star had faded. Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and uh, the Big Bopper died five years previous in on February second, nineteen fifty nine, the day the music died, um, when they all died in a plane crash, and that was very 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 felt in the in the rock community um and they weren't sure that any there was really going to be a a a bounce back and uh that kind of opened the door for the 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 early 60s folk revival um in new york and starting to spread out and then the beatles yeah (laughs) so it was like you I asked you a question off can off mic that I wanted to kind of get your feedback on is, is that I, I had asked you why these guys what was it that they had had that others didn't and you know I so you know right place right time more more than anything but um, what they said that they did and and this was an interview with Paul McCartney on the on the Beatles channel on the Sirius XM uh, radio network uh satellite radio network that he said their early songs for their first like several albums they pointedly made them saying she loves you i love you drawing in the audience saying that they were part of it um love me do love me do i want to hold your hand uh expressly reaching out to girls and really teenagers if you really listen to their early songs you know she was just uh, 17 you know what i mean you know they're in their early 20s they shouldn't be going after 17 year old girls but right the the guys that were buying their records were going after 17 year old girls yeah (laughs) And, uh, and so they knew their audience and um their 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 hook and they were so they sounded so different um their when they harmonized they were very different than any other group um most of the time there was a group where if there was a band there was one lead singer and it was only that person singing and sometimes they played an instrument sometimes they didn't but this had all like four. Stan the Man and his Barbarians or something right, like that. Right, right. Bill Haley and the Comets or, or right. um, you know, so when they came around, they're harmonizing, they're, um, all four of them get a shot at vocals here, here and there. Um, you can tell different voices and different, not only different voices singing, but different voices in the songwriting. Um, you can tell a George song when you hear it. You can tell a Paul song when you hear it. You can tell a John song when you hear it. But they were all very collaborative there in the beginning. And they just sounded very different to every, everyone else that was, that was out. And it's, it's hard to think now because they were so impactful. But, I mean, even coming out later the big groups um crosby stills and nash and young would not have been without the beatles right those those rich harmonies the birds although they owe Mm -hmm. much of their uh 
the success of their songs to Bob Dylan because they kept covering his stuff, their sound, they call it folk rock, but it was really harmonizing based off of the Beatles. So it was like this union between Bob Dylan and the Beatles. And the Grateful Dead even wouldn't have had their psychedelic psychedelic uh, sound and stuff if it hadn't been for Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour later on. It really sticks to me that, I really stick with this point, is that I think the bands that last the longest are the ones that are willing to move with the culture. Mm Mm-hmm. Because if the Beatles had, in 1968, still been trying to put out I Want to Hold Your Hand, <laughs> it, wouldn't have, it, it wouldn't have lasted. No, it, it wouldn't have, have it gone wouldn't anywhere. Worked. The world in the 1960s, millennials, you have to know, was changing. There is no decade in the, in the 20th century, probably maybe close, close behind the 30s. Mm-hmm. where there was a culture change, a revolution, a youth change, where um, this expression this, this expression moved with the revolution mm-hmm. that was happening in the culture. Mm-hmm. And you had um, – and they were also moving away from the values of their parents' generation. Mm-hmm. And the Beatles went along with that. The Beatles, and in many ways, led the yeah, way for that. Yeah, yeah. they, um, like I was telling you off, off mic, um, at one point, uh, Bob Dylan had said that there was like a, a triumvirate of influence in the 60s. He said, it's the Beatles, the Stones, and me. Mm-hmm. And that's really... A true statement um, because all three of those groups led that change um, things that they did became popular for everybody a year later right like, uh, the summer of love was in 67 and uh, that coincided with uh, Sergeant Pepper and uh, Magical Mystery Tour. Sergeant Pepper, this is now September 2017. Uh, Sergeant Pepper celebrated its 50th anniversary in July of this year. Yeah. So, you know, they they led all of that. The the peace, love, and understanding, and you know, give peace a chance. All of this was was implemented on them and on uh dylan's early work as a as a folk innovator and then in in his rock music and the rolling stones uh bringing in a lot of heavy old blues um rolling stones were generally regarded in the beginning mm -hmm. as being a harder um how do I say this? Harder edged version of the Beatles. Harder edged version of the Beatles. Yeah. And they were. They were. And they were. But that was only because of the time at which they they really began. Right. Um, they didn't begin really in the early they didn't come along in the early sixties like the Beatles did. They really kind of hit their hit their stride later. Right. When times had gotten when, as an old T V show says, when things were really rotten. <laughs> and um, but you can tell where their influence comes from. Oh yeah, you can yeah. you can hear it in their music. One of the things about the Beatles that I always love is the fact that their music. I can't stand it when I listen to a band whose music is not theirs. Mm-hmm. It, it feels it never feels genuine. It's like you're singing somebody else's song. It's like a right. Like a copy of something. If right. you look at the the credits in e- almost every Beatles song, you will see two names. You will see Lennon and you will see McCarthy. Mm-hmm. McCartney, excuse me. You will see those two names, and you know, and it's it, it is amazing. It will boggle your mind just how many songs those two guys wrote. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
And the funny, but the funny thing is, when they were first starting out on their first several records, uh, they did a lot of covers. Um, mm -hmm. Twist and Shout, Dizzy Miss Lizzie, um, even um, uh, what was it? Um, Till There Was You. It's from the Music Man. Yeah. Because um, Paul grew up in a musical family, but they were more traditional uh, show tunes and classical music. Um, when they were writing She Loves You, uh, they put it together in the dining room. They, they uh, John and Paul put it together in the dining room. They came out and they played it for Paul's father. And he, he said that's good, but if you could change the yeah, yeah, yeah to yes, 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 because then it's less rock and roll, it's less American. And <laughs> um, so they're, they were just different, and their fans let them move on because they, they, were, they were growing up, too. Um, when they played the Ed Sullivan show um, early February 1964, um, my mother was 13 years old. Uh, she would she would turn 14 in September, but she was like right there, you know, born in 1950. And she was like, that was that was it. She saw them on on uh, Ed Sullivan. And every time she saw them on television, she would just cry. Just yeah. Tears would just stream down her face. And those those girls that were screaming and boys too, the the, the fans that were just screaming, just they were overwhelmed with their love for this quartet in a way that no no other artist had ever and would ever experience again um it's just phenomenal when you see those old um those old performances if you if you find the the footage from their last live show before their rooftop concert in 69 uh their shea stadium appearance um they couldn't hear themselves at all yeah uh it, the only reason i think that they continued to play was because they knew they were being recorded and <laughs> uh but there was t there was there were times when they were doing their big big shows where they would play their records and they would just kind of strum along and pretend that they were saying they would lip sync because nobody could hear them out in the audience. It was just screams. Yeah. And, um, and I was telling you, um, Phil Collins, drummer for Genesis, singer for Genesis in his own solo career, Oscar winning screen, uh, songwriter is, very 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 briefly and unless you're watching the documentary where he points himself out you won't see him because he's very young um is an extra during the concert sequence the television show sequence uh, in a hard day's night um yeah and, he has to point it out to you right he you're is, not there you're not gonna see him <laughs> because he doesn't look like you're used to him seeing which is you know over 30 and balding uh yeah which is how i've always every picture of him i've ever seen going back into you know the 70s he just looked like he was over 30 and balding uh, <laughs> very few very few um musical artists between the 1960s and probably the 1990s all the way up have not been influenced or inspired in some way by the Beatles, yeah. by what they what they brought about. You were talking earlier about Ed Sullivan. Mm -hmm. Ed Sullivan grabbed hold of the Beatles um, early on, very quickly. Very quickly, he didn't even know their names. He kept calling them those bugs, those crickets, or whatever they call themselves. <laughs> he did that because he screwed up with Elvis. Yeah. Um, early on in Elvis's career, he had. Um, uh, uh, Ed Sullivan said he would never have that kind of performance on his fine, clean show. Mm -hmm. 
and then um, that left the door open for Steve Allen, who grabbed hold, who 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 booked Elvis. Yeah. And for the first time, Steve Allen beat Ed Sullivan in the ratings. Mm-hmm. And it's according to Steve Allen, he said as soon as he saw the ratings for our show, he forgot all about moral, um, ethical principles and moral scruples and booked <laughs> booked Elvis several times. <laughs> <laughs> but he said later on. Later on, when the, when the Beatles um, were becoming the biggest thing in the world, mm-hmm. Ed Sullivan snapped them up yeah, and insisted that, th- that they be on his show. And it was a, ma- a major career boost for them, a mm-hmm. massive career boost. Mm-hmm. There was nothing like it. No. And, um, but it was funny that they came on the show. He didn't even know what the band was called. <laughs> <laughs> And here's another thing. Here's the thing. Going back to a hard day's night, the word Beatles is never uttered. That's true. Yeah. You see it on. Um, you see it three times. You see it on um, Ringo's drum set. Mm-hmm. And then later you see it on his drum set again. But then during the final performance, it's flashing behind them. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, and of course it's in the uh, opening credits. But the, the word Beatles is never uttered. Right. I don't exactly know why. But that that was just an interesting thing I noticed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also, I want to tell you this. This was the first time that I was ever ever able to sit down and watch the film. Um, this uh, this past week, and I th- always thought that the best way see the film for the first time would have been in a theater it would have been and it it's an amazing experience in the theater i didn't get to see it there mm. but so i did the next best thing i got a criterion edition mm-hmm. which is a gorgeous print oh absolutely the, the, beautiful the transfer on that you do you have the dvd i have i have the it's a blu-ray dvd combo pack uh the 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 restoration is gorgeous, absolutely stunning. Well, I thought that it was. Um, I thought there was something wrong with it because when the movie starts, there is no studio logo. Right. And I thought that might have been a mistake because immediately it pops up. They're running down the street. You hear that ching, and off That's we go. The opening chord, yeah. That opening chord, and uh, I, I thought there was something wrong with it, but um, I understand also, and I cannot find this. There used to be a prologue, um, and that's what I was expecting to be there because when they re-released this film in 1982, there was a prologue, hmm. and uh, it was uh, right. I think it was re-released because of because of John's death. Hmm. And the prologue was I'm trying to I'm trying to remember what the song was, but the prologue was a bunch of photographs mm-hmm. over this song, and um, they were uh, it, it was all to commemorate. I'm sorry, it was all to commemorate John's death. Mm-hmm. But when uh, when I think it was Paul actually saw the prologue, he insisted that it be removed. Right. Okay. Because he said it kind of cuts down. I think it was the song "I'll Cry." Is it "I'll Cry Tomorrow"? Uh... Um. But he he didn't like it, so they cut it off. Right. And that's better because the song the the film does open just with them running down the street. Right. And I think that's perfect. Mm-hmm. Because. It starts rolling and never stops. Right. It just it just steamrolls through, and it's uh, it's so it's it's funny. The, uh, a little bit of trivia that that you may not have uh, uh, known. Um, there's a sequence when um, they're on the train, and Paul goes up with this bowler hat to these two girls. Mm-hmm. And he says, "Excuse me, would you uh, mind if uh, my my two friends wanted wanted to know if you would if you would let them sit there sit with you? Uh, I'd ask you only. I'm too shy." 
<laughs> one of those women, one of those young women, was uh, George's future wife, Patty. Oh, I didn't know that. Not only was it his future wife, Patty, but it's Eric Clapton's future wife, Patty, and the inspiration mm. for the song Layla. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, George and, pa- and Eric were best friends. Uh, Eric Clapton does the solo on um, While My Guitar Gently Weeps on the White Album. That's Eric Clapton, mm-hmm. not George Harrison. Um, and they were they were best friends, and uh, George and Patty were going through very difficult times, and Eric Clapton wrote Layla because he was struggling with the fact that he was in love with his best friend's wife. And Ooh. George and Patty got divorced. Eric and Patty got together. Eric and Patty divorced and uh george and eric continued to be very close um yeah but yeah she's 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 one of the girls that 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 uh that paul approaches mm, i didn't know that yeah the song i was trying to think of was i'll cry instead mm-hmm. Ooh. um but yeah that i love those little those little inside facts <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure this movie is full of them it it yeah and I did my homework on this film, and um, there are all kinds. Of, this is this is one of the reasons I watched it four times in the, in the same week, <laughs> was just because you keep catching because they talk so fast. They do, and you you really you you miss things mm-hmm. as they're going along. But um, I really enjoyed. It. I'm glad you really. I'm glad you finally got me out of my cosmic funk and finally able to see this film because I I absolutely loved it. It's spectacular. However, <laughs> my favorite Beatles film is the one we're going to talk about next. Um, if you would allow me to move on to sure. Yellow Submarine. A movie that which I've I wanna, also been watching since I was very, very young. <laughs> which I want to preface by saying this movie was inspired by something you can't see anymore. Yeah. Which is the Beatles cartoon series. I have looked and looked and looked, and you said that there's some of it on... Um, there's pieces of it. Pieces on of YouTube. it on YouTube, but it's largely gone. Yeah, you have to find bootleg copies. Um, and I'm ashamed to say that I did years ago via VHS. I don't know where my VHS is, but um, it had all 39 episodes. It, that ran on CB, on uh, ABC from 1965 to 1969. The series was adorable. It was a cute little cartoon series. It wasn't really heavy in any way. Every each, each and every episode was named after one of their songs. And then they tried to incorporate that title into something to do with the plot. And not a one of them did their own voice. <laughs> Not one of them did, but they were, um, at first, they were not, you know, they kind of turned their nose up at it, Mm -hmm. but then they saw it, and they loved it, Mm -hmm. and uh, that was one of the, that cartoon show was one of the reasons that they um, ultimately sanctioned Yellow Submarine. Mm -hmm. Um, Yellow Submarine was not a movie they wanted to make. It was part of a three-picture deal. Um, and the only reason they signed off on it was because it was a movie that they could sign off on for the music and not have to have anything to do with. Right. They show up at the end, but that's that's about They show up at the end. But the reason that they show up at the end is because when they saw the early rough cut of the of the animation, they were on board. Mm-hmm. And they do not do the voices. Uh, someone else does the voices. And they said that the reason that they were... Um, not wanting to kind of horn in and, and do their own, because they they could have easily said, we want to do our own voices. Oh, sure. They said the guys who were doing their voices were doing the very affected, you know, they were doing the very affected mm-hmm. Beatles accent, don't you know? And they were doing that kind of thing. And um, Paul said that really is where that came from. Yellow Submarine is the reason that people think that they talk like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he said that's really where it melded its way into the culture was because of Yellow Submarine. And, um, but they really got on board with this film. 
and um, it's a magnificent film. It started off with six songs and eventually grew to eleven. Mm-hmm. And it is a magnificent movie. Yes, yes, it um, is. I've seen it many, many times through the years. I've seen it probably as many times as you've seen A Hard Day's Night. And um, it is really one of the first films that I ever saw that wasn't Disney. And I always encourage people, if you're into animation, don't stick at Disney. You have to also explore outside of the Disney, mm-hmm. um, the, the Disney uh, library. And this is one of the places you need to go because yeah. it does not look or feel like anything else. And if you can, um, I, I've also seen this in the theater. Um, see, see it, see it in the theater. I mean, I've been, I've been watching this since I was very little. Um, I've probably seen, I've seen this more times than I've seen a hard day's night and help. So I, I've been watching this since I was little. Were a, a word for any, a word of warning for anybody who hasn't seen it. If you have a headache, don't watch it when you have a headache uh and don't uh, watch it inebriated whoa no yeah um it'll make you sick because i uh, it, the the sea of holes and the sea of green will just i made that mistake once i i'm prone to migraines and i was like well i'll just put this on and then that flashing in the sea of holes and i was like uh it was not a good idea so unfortunately unfortunately Time may have not been kind to the film because any time you ever watch this film, if you've never seen it, you have to understand that people will come to this film and immediately the very first thing you think of when you see it is flying circus. Yeah. Because the animation style in this, um, the cardboard cutouts, the, the real life uh, animation in the background, will remind you very much of Terry Gilliam's animation. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Terry Gilliam, yeah, Terry Gilliam's sure. animation on that show, which I'm convinced was, was completely influenced by this, by this movie. Um, it is, but you have to put that out of your mind because this is a glorious-looking film mm-hmm. because there are, it, it does this, this, this visual wraparound, this, um, this disconnection, with just having the real world animated, which I can't stand that. I can't stand a movie that's just, it's our world, only it's drawn or it's put in a computer. I can't stand that. This movie twists and turns the natural world or the the organic world into all of these different spaces. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it takes everything that you would expect and throws it out the window and never lets it come back in. Um, there's, there's a scene where there's an, uh, 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 a creature with a giant nose, and it sucks up everything that's on the screen. Mm-hmm. And then it goes around the edges and starts sucking up the entire screen until there, it's standing in the black, and then it starts sucking up itself. Mm-hmm. It's that kind of animation. Yeah. And, you know, the sea of holes, as you mentioned earlier, is like um, when they come out of one hole, and it's not like a floor with holes, it's like a box. Mm-hmm. So you've got one character that comes up out of one side, you've got one character that comes up out of the bottom, well, one and out then of the face. Somebody's, somebody's feet are in the um, right-hand corner of the screen and their their head is coming up out of the left ha- top left-hand corner of the screen so it's like opposite it's not it's not right uh, it does it's it not does spatially a lot of visual coherent paradox. yeah it's and it's, it's really it's hard wonderful. to describe you just have to see it <laughs> <laughs> and um, one thing to note is also you see a lot of um, characters around in the film, there are these incidental characters that you'll see in the background. Like you'll see a, uh, uh, a woman standing with an umbrella, or you see a man standing playing with his dog, and then you'll see this sea of people all with umbrellas and things like that. Those are all the animators. Hmm. 
they're all the there were two hundred people that worked on that animated this film. And you can tell. Yeah. But they'll do these cardboard cutouts where you see these people. There's a guy that does they do a close up of a guy wearing goggles. That's one of the animators. <laughs> so everybody that worked on this film got a part in the film. That's cool. And um it's a it's not a movie I can really describe though. It's it, and when you try to describe the plot, like the blue meanies invade Pepperland and they send young Fred who's like eighty years old out old Fred. to New No, he's young Fred. Okay, okay, young Fred. Uh in in this yellow submarine to go get help and he gets the Beatles and uh and he brings them back to Pepperland to to free it. Uh, this musical utopia place uh, where they bear a striking resemblance to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And you, you, can't, you, you, you can't encapsulate the essence of the movie with the plot summary because there's so much more going on. The, the plot is just there because it kind of has to be. Yeah. Uh, but... Um, it's just as funny as as anything else that they did. Uh, one of my favorite lines was they're in the yellow, they're in the submarine, and they're going through, and they see all these weird creatures as they're descending. And uh, I think it's Ringo. He goes, "Oh, look! It's a it's a cyclops!" And somebody else goes, "But it's got two eyes!" And he's like, "Oh, it's a bicyclops!" <laughs> I love that, <laughs> and I love it when they meet. I love it when they meet Jeremy Hillary Boob. Oh, he was the my, nowhere man. He's one of my favorite characters. You know, and um, he's rhyming. He's he does. He's an artist. He does all of these different styles of art. And uh, John sticks out of the. He he's always rhyming. Mm-hmm. And John sticks out of the side of the screen. And says, hey, Jeremy, you you have to rhyme all the time. And he says, if I spoke prose, you'd all find out. I don't know what I talk about. <laughs> <laughs> just that kind of it's a nonsense film it really is it's a lot of ways you know outside of the the basic plot it's a nonsense film it but it's pure joy it's it is pure joy or joy pure joy um Um, it's a little bit of alice in wonderland in that a lot of the world doesn't make sense mm -hmm. um but that's okay right because the visual experience is what you're there for Mm -hmm. um and by the way very much one of the greatest soundtracks of all time. Oh. I mean. Hands down. Hands down. This movie, let me tell you something. This movie, the, the songs Yellow Submarine and All Together Now, mm-hmm. bang around in the back of my head eternally. When I'm, when I'm working, when I'm doing something and I don't have music in my ears, those two songs are in my head. Hey, Bulldog is fun. Um, I love Hey, Bulldog. Yeah, they include they they had uh, Hey Bulldog was a, an edited scene mm-hmm. that they had to put back in. Yeah, in the later version. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, that's fine. Uh, a, a lot of the songs though that they have on here are were not originals for the mo- for the movie. Um, I think All Together Now and Hey Bulldog are the only two that they actually wrote for the film. Um, I thought they wrote the whole thing for it. Mm-mm. No, because um, Yellow Submarine was originally on Revolver. Uh, Nowhere Man was on Rubber Soul. Um, Obviously, Eleanor Eleanor Rigby was on Revolver. Um, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was, of course, on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Get by with a little help from my friends. All of that stuff was all... um, on other records except Hey Bulldog and All Together Now. They they were the only two original compositions for the for the for the film. Because Ringo said we never actually made an album called Yellow Submarine. Right, no. Mm-mm. But there was an album called Yellow Submarine, but it was the soundtrack to this movie. Right. Predominantly again, like, filled with with uh re releases of uh of previously previously released songs. Um well, let's move very quickly through some of the other Beatles movies. Okay. Um, 
Sorry. <laughs> I, I don't know if you were through with uh, Yellow Thumb. No, I, but... I, 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 I was, and I was going to say, you know, let's let's move on to Help, which you don't like, and I, th I think is... I think it's delightfully silly. It's really the lesser of their pictures, um, their feature it's length. The lesser films. of the trilogy. Um, the, yeah, it's the lesser of their their feature, really feature length, uh, theater released films. Um, it's it's silly. It's uh, it's it's their attempt at a sustained storyline, which uh, it doesn't it doesn't really gel. Cause they're, they're yeah when instead... i said earlier when i said earlier that i was i was happy that a hard day's night didn't have a plot like a burglar or something that's essentially what what's wrong with help yeah yeah it is they're trying to get a hold of one of ringo's rings right that yeah. was sent to him by um kahili worshiping uh indians played entirely by white british people um <laughs> Which has bothered me for a long time, um, but uh, it's a sacrificial ring, and they can't sacrifice the person unless they're wearing the ring. And so they're chasing after Ringo, and it won't—it's stuck on his finger. And uh, they're the the cult is chasing after him. Um, the scientist uh, played by Victor Spinetti, who also plays the TV director in A Hard Day's Night. It was um, great in Hard Day's Night. Yes, yes he is. Um, I won an award. It's in my office. It's hanging on the wall in my office. <laughs> Plays a great jerk. He, he really does. does. He does. He does. And um, his uh, um, assistant, um, Algernon, who is played by, give me a minute, Things are loading slowly. I only um, saw the film once. Oh, see, I've seen this tons of times. It was it, uh, Roy Kinnear played Algernon. Roy Kinnear later worked with Lester as the uh, the uh, D'Artagnan squire in the in the Three Musketeers and the Four Musketeers. And he's best known as Mr. Salt in. Uh, uh, he's best known as Mr. Salt in Willy Wonka. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And uh, uh, so, it's it's the silliness. It's um, they they had to make a movie, and they they decided um, they they were going along with all of this, and then they wanted to have a holiday in Bermuda, so which is why they end up in Bermuda, um, to to do that little bit near the end is because they just they wanted to go to Bermuda, so <laughs> it's. It's it's unfocused, but it's it's funny. And I always loved when I was a kid. I always loved their house, because they they mm. they walk in individually into one of these London row houses that that you always see, individual um, house, but all connected. And then when they walk inside, there's no walls in between it. It's all one house, and it's all like divvied up in between their their uh, personalities. Paul has a, a, a pump organ that comes out of the floor and mm -hmm. uh uh i think it's ringo's uh bedroom that has uh natural grass and a guy with uh with the fake chittering teeth that uh, that mows the grass and uh john's is a sunken bed in the in the floor and uh it's 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 cute it's funny but it's 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 strained it's very much strained. it feels to me like an extended episode of the monkeys yeah the... and it i i and it's one of the reasons that i really love hard day's night is because it doesn't hard day's night doesn't need all of that no no um i didn't need it it's, it's like it's it's trying to plot the beatles you yeah. can't plot the yeah. beatles the best the best parts of help are the songs which oh yeah, absolutely. Were, it was an original uh, score, original soundtrack. Um, Help is one of my favorite John songs, um, and you've got to hide your love away. Uh, mm -hmm. Just this, this, the songs, which is which is what they were. They were they were songwriters, and mm -hmm. the the songs and the performances were were spectacular in this. And um, 
that's really why you need to why why you should watch it but it's better to just listen to the record um yeah now uh moving moving on i think that's that's just about everything that i can really think of um there's not a whole lot to talk about with help no there's not so um what uh, what are what are what are your recommendations as we move to uh, to wrap okay. this up here? I'm going to recommend two films that are vastly different. Um, one is I want to recommend one half of the Complete Beatles, um, the series that was made, I believe, in '84, mm-hmm. um, which tells about 20 years in the life of, in, the, in their lives basically, uh, before, during, and after um, their success. What happened to them, how they, um, how they formed personal relationships, things that went on, and what happened ultimately in later years that brought them apart. Um, the first half, because the first half of this do- the documentary in the early days is more interesting, because you actually have, docu- you actually have concert footage and interviews with the Beatles, mm-hmm. which in the second half you don't get. Uh-huh. Um, the, the later half of the film, which talks about their breakup and all of that, may have come under, you know, maybe Paul and George and Ringo didn't want to talk about that stuff. Yeah. There are other people who talk about it. George Martin is um, uh, heavily interviewed. But the second half feels more like a standard documentary. Right. Uh, but the first half is fascinating because it tells you – they tell their own story. Mm-hmm. That's a weird dec- recommendation to recommend half a movie. But <laughs> <laughs> Beatles Anthology is kind of long, but it's, it's, a, it's it an interesting, complete package. Um, the other film that I wanted to recommend has nothing to do with the Beatles. It's a film directed by Richard Lester. Um, Richard Lester, you should know, um, the director of Hard, Hard Day's Night, was really – largely a director for hire. Yeah. Like we t- said earlier, he directed uh, The Three Musketeers for the Saul kind and also directed two of the uh, Superman movies. Yeah. He directed the great Superman 3, uh, Superman 2, well, he, and the unfortunate Superman 3. <laughs> he, direct, he directed half of Superman 2. He's the credited yeah, he directed director, him, yeah. but Richard Donner did actually all of the good parts. Um, mm-hmm. it, 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 the, the Richard Donner... Uh, cut that was put out later um, is very interesting. Uh. <laughs> if you know if you know Richard Lester's style, you can tell which parts of Superman two are his. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mostly the comedy bit. Mm-hmm. Um, the other film, one legitimate, really legitimate film that he did direct was a movie called Cuba, hmm. which he directed in 1979, which. And I love it when movies do this. They'll have a, a love story or something or some kind of personal story set against the backdrop of, um, of actual historical events, mm-hmm. kind of like Titanic. Right. Um, this one stars Sean Connery. He, he plays a mercenary, and he's in Cuba during the, the fall of Batista. And um, he hooks up with his old girlfriend, and you know, there he's uh, she's married to somebody else, and there's all this tension. You know, both internal and external. It's a really good forgotten movie hmm. because I think it was made during the time when when Sean Connery was trying to get away from James Bond, mm-hmm. and um, it's on DVD. But it's it's a really good movie. It's a really Check good it legitimate out. film. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Um, as per usual, um, you give two recommendations, and I'm going to give about six. Um, <laughs> That's the two I could think of. <laughs> um, first and foremost, um, the other two uh, Beatles group films. Um, Magical Mystery Tour, which is one of the single weirdest things I've ever seen in my life. It was an hour-long TV special directed by the Beatles. <laughs> um, the music is incredible. The, the visuals are absolutely bizarre. Like, I can't... You'd have to see it for yourself. It doesn't make... M- any there's no narrative thread not one like a sense it doesn't at all i mean it's maybe if you smoked some pot and dropped some acid it would make sense 
because I think that that's what they did when they were making it. But I but, think that's true of any film. Well, that's true. Um, but it's so bizarre. And the other one um, is uh, Let It Be, which was released in conjunction with the record that had originally been shelved. It was, it was uh, originally recorded in 1969 before they did the Abbey Road record. Um, but it was shelved. They, they did a movie directed by Lindsay Michael Hogue, who uh, claimed to be the only uh, male, uh, the only son to Orson Welles. It's, it's, Wells and his mother had had an affair lines up but there's never really been any proof that that he is the in he was in fact the son of Orson Wells he's he since died um now there's a career in a life we could do a whole show on <laughs> uh, I'm writing a book on it so <laughs> yeah um but you know the 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 documentary um it's it's kind of magnificent. This is this is the movie that won the Beatles their Oscars um, for original song score, which is no longer a category. Um, but it disappeared sometime in the '90s. Um, but the them putting all of this together and working together to like they'll play the original like the the concept for it, and then they'll start working out the parts. And um, this is also when they they went up to the roof in Abbey Road Studios and played their really their last live concert together. Um, a lot of songs that ended up on the record, um, Get Back and uh, One After 909 and stuff like that that, uh, that ended up. And it's a really good, it's a good picture into where they've ended up. Uh, that they're, they're trying to put this together and they're, they're, they're cordial to each other, so you don't see the really reality. But Yoko's always there, and there you can feel the tension, even uh, except when they're actually singing their songs. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's magical. Then um, the other pictures that I would recommend were um, both John and Ringo did films in the '60s by themselves. Um, John did another film with Richard Lester called uh, How I Won the War. And Ringo did a weird little movie called The Magic Christian. That's a weird movie. That's a bizarre film. <laughs> it is. And yeah. uh, the, uh, the other two... The other one recommendation that I have, and the other one is a kind of, if you like these people, don't watch this movie. Um, the recommendation is um, Martin Scorsese's uh, documentary on George Harrison that was released a few years ago called George Harrison Living in a Material World, which is the name of one of uh, uh, George's solo records. Um, it's like a three and a half hour, four hour. It's like what he did with uh, No Direction Home for Bob Dylan. Um, very in-depth, excellent documentary on George Harrison. Um, and the one that I would say stay away from, um, in the early 80s, Paul McCartney, I believe wrote and directed and did the, song, the sound, songs and soundtrack for a terrible little low-budget movie called Give My Regards to Broad Street. Oh, that movie is awful. <laughs> it's... Oh. Oh, bad. Um, that that it, if you ever want to see an example of what studio meddling feels like, yeah, that's the first movie you look for. It's so bad, and and the songs are so good. It's uh, I think that's where he what what he wrote like silly love songs and no more lonely nights and and uh, quite quite a few really good songs, but. The, the, I mean, it's it all focuses on Paul trying to recover um, master tapes that were stolen. Or, or some, it's been a long time since I've seen it. It's so bad. And it's... if you're feeling in a bizarre mood, there is one movie I have got to mention. Because I absolutely loved this movie as a kid. It's, it's one of, I think, if, it may be the only movie that Ringo ever did solo. It was a bizarre film from 1981 called Caveman. 
where it, it it's a it's a parody and it takes place in caveman times. <laughs> he, he's a caveman, and the funniest joke in the movie is that um, for me is that every there's a running gag where there's a Tyrannosaurus Rex sitting on a cliff, and when the moon comes out, he bathes like a coyote. <laughs> And then the next day, when it when the when the sun comes out, he he crows like a rooster. <laughs> that's that's the funniest scene in the movie. And you may have a b- more bizarre sense of humor than I did, but it, it's it's a crazy film. Well, actually, that uh, I loved when I was ten. <laughs> <laughs> Ringo actually did quite a lot of acting stuff later on. He, of course, was uh, the conductor on Thomas and Friends. Yes, he um, was. Yes, he was. I forgot he was, about that. He was in Give My Regards to Broad Street. Um, he he was in uh, Blind Man, which he did the score for, um, which kind of got buried. Like it's you can't find it too much too many other places. But they've played the title song um, on the Beatles channel. Um, oh, and by the way, they're all three on the Simpsons. Yes. Uh, yes. George. Paul and Ringo are all on The Simpsons, mm-hmm. and all of their appearances are hysterically funny, <laughs> but they never appeared together. No, and uh, so he did a lot of he did a lot of of weird acting. I mean, he was even in the um, pop star Never Stop Never Stopping with uh, Never with, saw that. I haven't seen it yet either, but I'm just looking at his credits. Um, the other the other thing that I wanted to mention that is kind of Beatles adjacent. Um, George Harrison was also a film producer in his mm-hmm. own right. Um, Dark Horse Films. He also started Dark Horse Comics. Um, was his comics label. I don't know if you knew yeah. that. Um, but the most prominent film that Dark Horse Pictures uh, produced was this little film from this tiny, unknown little comedy troupe um, called Monty Python's Life of Brian. Uh, in 1978 he adored monty python and uh they were looking to do their second film after uh holy grail and george harrison came to them and said whatever you need i'll put up the money for it whatever you want to do <laughs> now that's love <laughs> you just do it and i'll give you the money for it and they they produced one of the funniest films of the 70s and their their greatest achievement outside of their television show <laughs> And if you ever really want, and one more, <laughs> one more little thing here, if you ever really want to step outside the Beatles and learn about their previous drummer Pete Best, mm. um, Backbeat, yeah, is an interesting film. It's not a great film because it's not really about the Beatles all that much. It's more just about Pete Best mm-hmm. and what what his personal life was. Um, it's like I say, it's not a great film. It's interesting. Yeah, but. Just as a completist, <laughs> check out Backbeat. So I think that about wraps it up for us here on on the Pod Bay Doors. Uh, we very much appreciate you sticking with us. And uh, Jerry, I thank you for indulging me on my uh, tribute. <laughs> well, to... <laughs> I'm, I, I so enjoyed being introduced to this movie because next week you are going to indulge me. <laughs> Because next week, we are going to step into a very scary arena, and we are going to dedicate the month of October to our favorite horror films. Yes. And I am going to force you into a movie that has lived in my brain for 35 years. It is Steven Spielberg's 1982 masterwork called Poltergeist. Well, it was technically directed by Toby Hooper, who just recently passed away. Um, so you say. But it was it but, was directed by Steven Spielberg. <laughs> look, the man's name appears in the credits five times. I mean, I yeah, just... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and and I've seen this once, um, <laughs> and it's it's on its way from Netflix, uh, uh, but. Um, so far, I have at least five copies of this on home video. <laughs> so far, and I and I want to bring this up now, um, that this is our. What number are we on now? 
eleventh or twelfth episode. Something like that. And I have introduced you to two movies. Actually, we've we've worked ahead and and have watched some that we're going to be covering later. Um, so I've introduced you to three movies: The Wild Bunch, A Hard Day's Night, and Dreamcatcher. Mm-hmm. You have introduced me <laughs> to two films that w- if if you're confused why we were doing A Hard Day's Night and the, and the Godfather last week, we've moved our, our promised bad movies to November and we're calling it Turkey Month and we're doing four bad movies to, to celebrate Turkey Month. No, in the month of November. In the month of November. And uh, you've introduced me to two films, uh, God's Not Dead and God's Not Dead 2. Mm-hmm. I'm winning. <laughs> you know what? Misery loves company. And I had to share this with you. I had to share those two, those two little butt nuggets with you because I, I didn't want to suffer alone. Honestly. Well. But I'm about to. But I'm about to. I'm oh, about no. to force you into a corner to talk about one of the great, one of my favorite movies of all time. I'm sorry. You've introduced me to three movies. The other one was It Follows which uh, I I already have watched. Um, I hadn't seen it before, but that's going to be in in our... uh, Do we want to call it Shocktober? Because it sounds like everybody else has called it Shocktober. But Shocktober, we're going to... Some of our favorite uh, horror films. Um, And I still have no idea how you felt about it follows, but... It was... We'll get there. So... (laughs) I'm still winning. Um, (laughs) Next week is Poltergeist. Um, Following that is uh, Guillermo del Toro's magnificent masterpiece, The Devil's Backbone, from 2001, or 2000. Um, I know you probably thought I was going to say Pan's Labyrinth, but no, The Devil's Backbone is probably the best ghost story told outside of Japan, outside of Quidon. In, in, Second best ghost story. The next, the best ghost story we're talking about next week. Well, <laughs> um, and then we are doing your pick, which is it follows. It follows, and then um, but there's five Mondays, so uh, we're doing Psycho. And then is my pick. Mm-hmm. And uh, we collaborated on a choice for the day before Halloween, uh, which will be Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Um, so we are very much looking forward to to this month um, coming up. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for indulging me on my on my. Uh, I enjoyed it. Birthday tribute to my to my to my late mother. Um, and thank you all for listening to us uh, and sticking with us throughout all of these episodes. We greatly appreciate it. Give us your, your thumbs up, your likes, uh, your comments, anything that you would like us to eventually get around to talking about. We would definitely love to hear from you. Um, and I think that about wraps it up. Uh, I am Doug Heller film critic and film historian for TalkMovieToMe.com. You can find me on Twitter at TalkMovieToMe1. And for Jerry Dean Roberts, whom you can find at ArmchairCinema.com, ArmchairOscars.com, and on Twitter at ArmchairCMA. And that about wraps it up for us. Thank you again. And the pod bay doors are now closed. The mission has been completed.